God's Word. <clears throat> Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. <clears throat> Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gate unto the city. So be it. So I hope that video from Leviticus maybe gave you a little insight on some things. Hopefully you're reading along with us. Hopefully you're not getting bogged down. We're in the beginning of the book now, and we just read from Revelation in the end of the book. And let those who are holy continue in holiness, and let those who aren't continue the way they are. Man has a choice. He has free will whether to worship God or not. Let's start out with prayer. Father, we do thank You and praise You that You are a righteous and holy God. Lord, that we need to be cleansed from our unrighteousness. And because of that, and because of Your justice, but also because of Your love and Your mercy and Grace, You provided Jesus, the ultimate scapegoat, that would take away our sins once and for all. It would not only bring us into a relationship with You, but bring us into a relationship with You as children of God. Lord, may we read Your Word today. May You speak to us through Your Spirit. And may we apply that to our lives so that we live more of a life that is like Christ, more of a life that is honoring to You. May we bring glory and honor to You, for Thy will be done and Thy kingdom come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're reading in Leviticus, and if you're not, you're kind of missing out because you don't know exactly what we're talking about. You'll you expect today you're going to get to Bodily fluids is what you're going to get to today. Woo, what a good topic. So it's easy not to get burdened down with that, but if you see the whole picture, then you can say, wow, look what Jesus freed me from. Look at the holiness of God. Look at the love and mercy and grace of God. So you know, when Jesus came on the scene 2,000 years ago, 3,500 years after Moses wrote down these laws at Mount Sinai, the Israelites were still having to obey these things in the law. 1,500 years they had to do everything that you're reading about in Exodus. And they had to go to the high priest to meet God, to intercede with the people like you saw in the video. We don't have to do that as Christians. We are priests. We are a priesthood to this world. We are children of God because of faith in Jesus Christ. Does that make a little more sense about Leviticus now and what you're reading? The burdens and everything that Jesus took off of us, and He said, take on my yoke instead. It's light. But we don't realize that. We still walk around in darkness so much because we think that's going to be a burden. But Jesus has freed us from the penalty of sin, and He's freed us from the power of sin, and He's freed us from all of these things in the law. Because the law could not save us. It just showed us what a wretched, pitiful person we are in God's sight. But yet He still loves us. Wow! Praise be to God for Jesus Christ. So if you have been reading, when you came across Exodus 32, you probably thought, Wow! How could God not punish Aaron? He was the high priest. And when Moses was away for just a few weeks, he turns to building a golden image which God had specifically told them not to do. How could Aaron do this? And then the Levites went through the camp and killed 3,000 people. But Aaron, nothing happened to Aaron. What kind of justice is that? 
But see, God says, I'll show mercy to who I'll show mercy to. It's His right. He is the one who gives the law and dictates what's right and wrong. And some of these bodily fluids might not make sense to you because we live in a different time frame where we don't understand some of those things. I gave an illustration of that last week with, with going to get canned goods versus what you grew up in canning with our kids today. They don't, we don't understand the same things. But Jesus has freed us from all of those things. But they had to come and be cleansed even from bodily fluids before they could come into God's presence. They had to have a mediator. They had to have the continual blood sacrifice. And if you're reading that and understand that, they had to give the best of their herd. Their herd was their wealth. We talk about how much do I need to tithe? How much do I need to give? What can I get by with? Where the more that they sinned, the more that they just touched impure things, the more they had to give of their wealth to teach them, to teach us that God is the giver of all things in the first place. So why are you coveting the Tenth Commandment things instead of worshiping the one who created all things? Leviticus making a little more sense? So when you're in Exodus 32, you said, how could God not punish Aaron? Then maybe you thought, wow, God gave Aaron mercy. I kind of like that because <laughs> I'm a sinner and I deserve to be per punished. But if you made your way to Leviticus 10 now, you see that Aaron got punished. Maybe you don't call it that, that Aaron suffered. Two of his four children were burnt alive in the presence of God, in the presence of all of Israel. And their cousins had to take their burnt bodies outside of the camp. Aaron couldn't leave his post to mourn his children, to mourn his sons. I think he got punished. And then if you keep reading in that chapter, two, his only two remaining sons sinned against God. Oh, where are we at in this story now? What's going to happen? But God showed them mercy. Because He chooses who He's going to show mercy to and who He's not. Because He is sovereign. He rules over everything. He's beyond time and space and any other dimension. But you have free will on whether you're going to worship Him or not. So I entitled this message, I'll get to it now, I have it here somewhere. I entitled it, Washing Away Your Sins, Washing the Sin Away. And we made a mistake in the bulletin until I caught it, and Sherry had, and I didn't catch it, I'm not blaming her by any means. She had washing the sin away. <laughs> so your bulletin has a little space where that's marked out. Washing the sin away. And see, even little things like that, mistakes, if they touched something that was impure, if a woman, if you read where we're at right now, why? After she was, gave birth, she was unclean with a male child for 33 days, but unclean with a female child for 66 days. I don't have all the answers, and scholars don't have all the answers. I'll tell you what makes the most sense to me, reading and studying God's Word. When the boy was circumcised on the eighth day, there was blood. There was pain, marking him as a child of God. So he carried part of the uncleanliness. You had two people carrying the uncleanliness, the mother and the child. Therefore, the time was split in half. Oh, there's two ways to look at a glass, half full, half empty. So you say, in this case, it wasn't that God was looking down on women and women children by having twice as much. No, by the male child having to suffer in bloodshed, he cut it in half. The male child should have been 66 also, but because of God's mercy and grace and the blood that was there and marking him as a child of God, circumcised. What a strange way to mark the children of Israel, but it's the way God did. That that time of purification was cut in half. See, it all depends on how you tie everything together in the Bible. When you see God's justice perfectly balanced with His love and His mercy and His grace. Did you read your light in life from January? This is not the current one. This is January. It's not February. Did you read it? We get enough copies for everybody. I'm going to challenge you and spur you on to read this as well as read your Bible. The January one has got a little kid here on front, and he's yelling out Exodus 24-7. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. 
I think this is perfect that this is a little child yelling this out. Because we're children of the Most High. And we yell that out to God all the time. I will be obedient and obey everything you've commanded. I'm reading my Bible, love my enemy. Well, not that one. Right? Hmm. A little child has every intention of saying, Daddy, I'll do exactly what you say till you catch me doing what I'm not supposed to be doing. But see, God knows everything. He knows our heart. There is no hiding from Him. He searches a man's heart to see if it's steadfast and after Him. That's why Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second is to love your neighbor because that's going to be proof that you love your God. A new command I give you to love one another as I have loved you. There were several articles in here and you can get them online um, from the Free Methodist website if you don't have it anymore. But I wanted to mention some of these because I didn't read it until this week. And I'm like, wow, this goes so good along with what we've done. And I didn't read this beforehand. And thinking about, hey, we should read the Bible together as a body of Christ. This is what all the articles are in this light in life. is about reading God's Word together as the church. There are, some of the articles ask some of these questions. How do I hear from God? How do I know this is from God? What should I do after I hear from God? Aren't those important questions? That's what we're studying in 1 Corinthians. We're seeing a church that is listening to the world instead of listening to God. They are not united in the Spirit, but they're divided in what they call the Spirit and the spiritual gifts they have. And we're in 1 Corinthians 14 tonight, and we see the issue going back to tongues. 1 Corinthians 14 is one of the most misquoted passages of Scripture in the Bible. It's where we get so many of the beliefs in tongues that need to be present to show that you really are a Christian because that's what some people teach. The Spirit gives gifts according to what the Spirit designs and wills for the building up of the body. So how could the church in Corinthians be using tongues in a spiritually <coughs> given way since they weren't using it to build up the body? So we'll be talking about that tonight. Some of the articles talked about the fact that we need to be intentional in reading God's Word as a church so that we can learn, hear, recognize, and apply these words to our lives. The Word of God. You want to know how He's going to talk to you, but yet you don't spend enough time reading His Word? That doesn't make too much sense, does it? You're going to hear from God through His written Word. And then the Word became flesh and lived among us. We have Jesus' life, which is God's Word, which is God in the flesh. And Jesus tells us clearly to follow in His footsteps. To be intentional about hearing from God's Word, not using human wisdom, but the wisdom given to us by the Spirit as we read God's Word is born again Christians and the Spirit reveals God's Word to us so that we can apply it and live. Because we need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He is calling His children together. If you've been born again, you are His child now and forevermore. To live out your life in this world and then to live out your life in all eternity. Here are some of the articles or some of the things stated from the different articles. The Bible, it has answers. It answers the core questions that we all have and gives us a window into better understanding God. It answers the question, how do I get to where I'm supposed to go and do what I'm supposed to do? The God who reveals Himself and makes Himself known. The God who pursues relationship with His creation from Genesis to Revelation and beyond. So we'll read that from cover to cover. What translu translation should we use today? First, use the translation that you'll want to read. That's why I keep bringing out different translations so you don't get stuck on what some people say, oh, the NIV is from the devil. The King James is the only version. No, there are different ones that different men of God have looked at through translations, through transcripts. You know, when the King James was written, we didn't have the Dead Sea Scroll findings, did we? So we have a lot more information now to apply. 
Now make sure you're reading an authorized Bible, and it would be helpful as this article, article says, it says, besides your favorite, the one that's speaking to you, you might choose a second translation for comparison so you can think deeper, so you can examine what those words really mean. So when you read something like in Genesis 6 where it repented God that He ever made mankind, you'll know that, wait a minute, the word that I'm thinking for repent doesn't quite make sense here. Repent makes me think that I've done something wrong and I regret it because that's what I think in English. But what it means here in Hebrew is that it made God sorrowful. Well, you don't think God knew that because He's sovereign and everything? He didn't know that He'd have to go through the pain and suffering? You had children, didn't you? <laughs> the ones that have yet. You guys wait a while, okay? You did it regardless of the pain and suffering that you knew you would have because of the joy that you would have. What more of a perfect heavenly father that he would create children who would decide to follow him or not? And that he would create a perfect place, a new heaven and a new earth for us to reside in forevermore for those who simply put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What an extravagant means of love and grace. Jesus said this. He said that man shall not live by bread alone, right? What's the rest of that? But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How are you going to know them again unless you read them? Right? That's why I challenged you. Do you know we're 48 days into this? That means it's not too late for you guys that didn't take the challenge. 48 days out of 365, that's 12 to 13 percent. If it takes 15 minutes a day to do your reading, then for the next 12 days, if you would read one hour to catch up, plus the 15 minutes that you need to read, by March 1st you'll be caught up with us that are reading it, that are spurring one another along, and you'll be in the midway through the book of Numbers. New Year's resolutions tend to fail because you don't get with somebody else that spurs you along. If you decide your New Year's resolution is to go to the gym and get fit, chances are if you go by yourself, you're going to fail. If you go with a friend, your chances greatly increase. You know most New Year's resolutions are long gone. 50% of them are gone by mid-January. 60% of them were gone by February. By Valentine's Day, 85% of New Year's resolutions were chunked out the window. We're past all those dates. We're supposed to spur one another. The sign that we have of the new church is Acts 2, where they sold everything they had. They gathered together and had things in common. So no one was in need. Don't miss that point. Because they realized that God provided all things so they didn't worry about the things of this world. Instead, they worried about showing homage, worship to the Creator and the Giver of all things. And they met together daily and studied God's Word and prayed. That's the picture we have of the church. We don't look like that as a church. No offense. We don't look like it. And that's the example I hope and pray we don't look more like the Corinthian church, but many times we will if we don't gather together and spur one another and remember Leviticus and all these other things to realize what God did for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus said that man cannot live by bread alone. It's not going to do you any good to nourish your physical body and not nourish your soul with God's Word. Because what's going to happen, as in Paul said in Corinthians, you're going to die bankrupt without the love of God. And you're going to enter into an eternity without God, apart from God forevermore. Matthew 4, 1-3, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This is right after He is baptized and recognized as the Son of God. He is sent into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. No food to eat or anything. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Mark that in your Bibles. Remember that. He was hungry. When I'm hungry, what do I want to do? Eat. 40 days worth. 
I've never been hungry like that. I've never been hungry. My stomach grumbles. That's not what the word hunger means. The word hunger means that you're without the nourishment that you need. There are people in this world that hunger, and we're called to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Most people here have never been hungry. But Jesus was hungry. The tempter came, the Satan, the devil of old, the father of lies, the one that's come to kill, steal, and destroy. He came to Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. Logical, wise in man's wisdom. It's time for you to eat, Jesus. But what was the devil saying? Listen to me instead of listening to God. Take the wisdom of the world instead of God's world and God's purposes. Eat. Does it sound familiar to something you've read in Genesis, if you've been reading along? Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. Mark that word. One afternoon exercising, walking around, hunting, burning some energy, Esau was famished. What's the rest of his story? He sold out his birthright for some food. His birthright. The fact that he was the firstborn son and he would get half of what all the father had. That he was the firstborn supreme in his ranking with all of his sons. Let's read on. <clears throat> Verse 30, he said to Jacob, Quick, because I want this instant gratification that this world so much teaches us and our children today. Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die. Sure he is. <laughs> I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is this birthright to me? Thinking of the here and now rather than the things that last. But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and was merry, for tomorrow he might die, right? That's the philosophy of this world. He ate and drank, then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Maybe you didn't understand those words when you read it. Esau despised the privilege that God had given him. The birthright he had as the firstborn son. Hmm. For instant gratification. Is that what Satan is trying to do with Jesus when he's tempted in the wilderness? Is he coming to Jesus in the famished state? and saying, sell out your birthright as the Son of God, because if you are the Son of God, you can tell these, these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered with a wise thing from Scripture, <laughs> also quoting the Old Testament, that man cannot live by bread alone, but instead he needs to live by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth, Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy. We haven't got there yet. Deuteronomy chapter 6. What's that chapter? You hear me say it a lot. It's the one that says to teach your children to write it on the doorposts, to talk about it when you get up, to talk about it when you sit down, talk about it when you go to bed, so that they will know and know, O Israel, that the Lord your God is God and that He has come out from a people calling a nation to calling a church. Children of the Most High. Royal priests that don't have to do all those things you saw written down that you're reading about. Because all those things have been done for you by Jesus Christ. So now your mission is to go out and be the light of the world. To be a city on the hill that it does not hide its light to be salt and flavor and preservative to the world, to show others the way that no one might perish, but all may have eternal life. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1 says, You must carefully follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and multiply. 
Children are a blessing and heritage from the Lord. They're knitted together in their mother's womb by God. <clears throat> and enter and possess the land the Lord swore to your fathers, the land flowing with milk and honey, not the <laughs> land we're going to inherit as children of the Most High. Not heaven, not eternal bliss. A land that was good that the Lord promised them, but nothing like we're going to inherit. Verse 2, Remember that these 40 years the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness so that He might humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart. He already knew it was to show you. Whether or not you would keep His commands, He humbled you. And in your hunger, look, there you go, hunger, there it is again. In your hunger, He gave you manna to eat. Jesus knew he didn't need to turn stones into bread. God would give him the nourishment that he needed because he had a mission. He had a mission to tell the world of salvation, reconciliation back to God because he would lay down his life for his friends. He didn't need to tell stones to turn into bread. He could have, but he didn't need to because he had his total faith and trust and reliance on God through the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. We didn't get a piece of Holy Spirit. We got the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He humbled you and in your hunger He gave you manna to eat, which neither, neither you nor your fathers had known. Something new and excitingly wonderful. Uh, so that you might understand that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Well, now from the mouth of the Lord, we're in Leviticus chapter 15, 16, 17 of the day, roughly. And we're reading about bodily discharges. Well, I don't know about you, but I needed some spurring one another to get through it all. To let these things tie together so you could see that, so you could be excited about going home and reading about bodily discharges. And you can tell everybody, you can tell your friends that, I've got something exciting to tell you. I read about bodily discharges today. Let me tell you how that ties together with Jesus. They'll look at you like you know, you're crazy, but it, aren't they supposed to look like you like you're different than the world? So are you hanging on? Are you reading God's Word? If you're not, will you join us? Okay? 48 days, 12 days, one hour, plus your 15 minutes roughly, you're caught up by March 1st. If you're getting bogged down, remember that you've got brothers and sisters. Talk to someone who is reading. Maybe they needed you to call them to discuss. Maybe that's the reason you're going to reach out to them and they reach out to you. And then maybe, you know, while, while you're there and we were talking about these bodily discharges, would you pray for my family? Hmm. We come together just like the Acts 2 church. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I think that's a good plan. I think it's the Lord's plan. Each and everything they had to do brought them together. Yeah, they grumbled. Yeah, they complained. Yeah, they didn't understand. But it was bringing them together as a holy, set-apart people for the world to see. Rahab saw it when Jericho was destroyed and she and her family were saved from a pagan city. Let us be a light to this world. When you fail to read the Bible, especially Leviticus, how can you hear God's Word? How can you recognize what is from God and what's not? How will you not be led astray if you're not diving into it? Especially like we're going into today on the issue of tongues. There are many denominations that say that when the Spirit comes on you a second time and you start professing in tongues that you really and truly are what God has called you to be then. You read and examine that. Don't take my word for it or not word for it to see if that is biblical or not. And most of it comes from 1 Corinthians 14. A church who is speaking in tongues and has been warned about their speaking in tongues because they're not using it in a built up and edified way. And then Paul goes back to it in Corinthians 14 comparing prophecy to tongues. Because he says, if someone comes into your church and you're all speaking in tongues, whether from the Spirit or not, or if someone comes into your church and you're all prophesying, meaning you're telling of God and His Word 
understanding it and speaking it correctly, then isn't that going to benefit the person? Because what's going to happen, and I challenge you to read 1 Corinthians 14 with us, what's going to happen is those people, it says in verse 30 roughly, I don't remember where it's at exactly, is those people are going to think you're nuts. Not nuts in a good way, but they're going to leave. And you're not ever going to get to prophesy and tell them about Jesus Christ. That's why God has intelligible rules. And in 1 Corinthians 14, you'll also find that verse that God is not a God of chaos. So be careful with what your doctrines are. Study God's Word. The Awana's theme verse is what? Mike, putting you on the spot. Study to show thyself approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. God's Word. Because He studies it. So that He can apply it. That He can live His life and bring up His children in holy fear and admonition of the Lord. And then when He discovers the love of God through Jesus Christ... Love casts out all fear because then I know that that power and authority over me is a loving father who would never condemn his, only, his own child. He's already condemned his only son to save me. Wow, what a loving God. Leviticus. Maybe it makes a little more sense. Maybe you can trudge through it. We're halfway, give or take. There's a lot of repetition. Ah, oh, maybe we need to hear the same things over and over and over, right? Jesus tells His disciples when He teaches them how to preach, He says, continue knocking, continue seeking, continue asking. Do it persistently. And He gives the example of the persistent neighbor. Just keep doing it. Even in the wee hours of the morning. Because if your neighbor will answer you and finally give you Bread, again, oh, coincidence, right? Something to eat. How much will your heavenly Father give you food through the Holy Spirit? That's what that says in Luke. It says, how much will your, more will your heavenly Father give you the Spirit? Whoa, wait a minute. As I read and study and see all these implications of food and how I've got to hunger and thirst for God's Word and feed upon it, how much more will God do that for somebody who is keeping on asking Him for it? Because He wants to be revealed. Let me give you an example from Matthew about how the Levitical laws were still in effect in Jesus' time. Matthew 15, starting in verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law, the ones that taught these laws from Leviticus, they came to Jesus from Jerusalem and they asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Now look at those words. What were Jesus' disciples breaking? The traditions of who? The elders. Not the commands of God, but the traditions of men. Religion. Hmm, now maybe we understand why there's so many different denominations and so many different things and everything. And we can't come together as the church that Jesus said He would build. And I'm not downing denominations. Don't go take my words out of context. Okay? I'm saying why can't we come together beyond denominations to worship God corporately outside of that? Why do we let things divide us rather than what should be uniting us? Okay? They were divided here. The religious leaders were divided against the population because they made traditions that oppressed the population because they couldn't keep them. But the Pharisees made it where they could keep them. Do you remember when Jesus came in and threw all the money changers out of the temple? He said, Stop turning my father's house of prayer into a house of den and robbers. The people that were selling the, the things there, a lot of them were the religious leaders and everything. They had written the laws in the way where you had to come by because you couldn't carry your animal there and stuff because it would break this tradition that you'd have to buy your sacrifice there at the temple, which guess what? They owned those flocks and they charged four or five times a going rate. Huh. That doesn't seem like that person's leading me correctly. These were the traditions of elders. Not all elders. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. 
He was a Pharisee. Nicodemus stood up for Jesus at the end of John. Read it through. See the story. Tie it all together. Here's what they claimed they were, that Jesus' disciples were doing. They don't wash their hands before they eat. Ceremonial washing. We're there. We understand that. We don't understand it as much because we wash our hands for clean hygiene, for bacteria. They washed it to be ceremonial clean. See the difference? Okay? So the Pharisees are saying, your disciples are doing wrong, Jesus. Jesus replied, verse 3, And why do you, Pharisee, teacher of the law, why do you, pointing at them directly, break the command of God? Not the tradition of the elder, but the command of God. Not God's, God, the sovereign God of Israel. Because that's what he's telling, Jesus is telling them they're doing. They say they're doing one thing. They say that they will obey everything, but their heart is far from him. Why do you break the command of God? Oh, look at the next thing. Four is a preposition, tying that together. You break it for what reason? The sake of your tradition. I say I'm loving my neighbor. I'm going to church. I'm doing all these right things. But yet I have hatred in my heart for whatever. Then my heart's far from God. Jesus said you'll love. That's what Paul says to the Corinthian church. <laughs> love, love your brothers and sisters in Christ. No wonder 1 Corinthians 13 has become a marriage uh, chapter rather than a chapter for the church because Satan's a deceiver and he doesn't want us to know that keeping no records of wrong, being patient and kind and long suffering and not vengeful is for each one of us so that we don't stop meeting together and spurring one another so that we do recognize what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Verse 4, for God said, you'll find it back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and stuff if you read it. For God said, honor your father and mother. And on top of that, anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Well, now wait a minute. That's one of those ones I don't understand. We would all be deserving of death. <gasps> yeah, we are. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. And the wages of sin is death. And every child has dishonored their father and mother and deserves death. But life comes through Jesus Christ. Wow! What a great thing God's done for me. But now Jesus is talking directly to the Pharisees here. So that's not really what He's implying. What He's implying is you're doing a sin against your mother and father right now. So He's going to give them the example of that. You say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God. They are not to honor their father and mother with it. So what does that mean? Now you have to do a little studying there. They had a law called Corban, which means if I take my possessions and I dedicate them to God, they're off limits. They're holy and set apart. They can still stay in my bank account. I don't have to take care of my parents who are getting old and need my flocks, my money, to take care of them. They're getting old and I don't want to waste any money in it. We didn't, they didn't have old folks' homes. They could just put them away in then and let Social Security take care of them. They were taught by God to honor their father and mother and take care of them in their old age because they took care of you as children. They didn't have to. They chose to. Why, so why would you not want to? But the Pharisees and religious rulers said, if I dedicate this money to God, then I don't have to take care of my mother, mother and father. Wow, their hearts are far from being teachers of the law, aren't they? Because that's not what the law implied at all. Thus, in verse five, 6, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. Verdict's out. Verse 7, you hypocrites, you're only actors playing on a stage. I've called you out. Isaiah was right. We're going back to the Old Testament. He was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
How many times do we need some open heart surgery from Jesus? Well, before you realize that, you've got to stop and examine yourself first too, right? And maybe it takes some time of being tied together for someone to point that out to you. Where would David have been without the priest coming to him and saying, what would you do in this case, David? And then David realized and said, to you, O Lord, and only to you have I sinned. Examine my heart. Search me, O Lord. Next verse, verse 9. They worship me in vain. They're going to be spiritually bankrupt when they leave this world. This world. Their teachings are merely human rules. They have no salvation. They have no firm foundation in Jesus Christ. They don't love one another. They don't even love and honor their parents. The parents that God sovereignly gave them. Good, bad, or indifferent. God still chose to give them for His purpose and His will. Not yours. Jesus called the crowd to Him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to Him. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Of course Jesus knew this. That was His purpose, to lead them to repentance. He replied, verse 13, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter, the rock of the church, he said, explain this parable to us. He didn't know it. So he asked God to reveal it, asked Jesus to reveal it. He searched to find the answer. And Jesus' answer wasn't that great to him at first. Are you still so dull? Are you not listening? Are you not paying attention? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? Because he was still caught on these ceremonial cleansings and things, but not understanding what they were pointing to. They were pointing to a Savior who would cleanse us once and for all. But the things that come out of a person's, person's mouth comes from the heart, and these defile them. How is your heart? Do you love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? Verse 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder. I'm not guilty of that. Jesus is clear about that. If I've been angry and had hatred in my heart towards a brother, I'm guilty of murder. Adultery. I'm not guilty of that. If I've looked with lustful eyes upon a woman, I'm guilty of it. Jesus clarified these things. Sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile them. The video was pretty clear about that today, saying those things don't make you sinful. But they make you unholy in God's presence. So we need to be cleansed to different things. Jesus took care of sin. He took care of the uncleanliness. He took care of it all. You are now the priest at Impel, the temple of God, even the Holy of Holies. For the curtain was torn the day that Jesus died on the cross so that we could enter in freely to God and cry out through our spirit, Abba, Father, dear Daddy in heaven, teach me. Leviticus is full of crazy rules, but they point us to a crazy Savior who would give up His life to save us so that we might live, have abundant life. So i got some more homework for you on top of everything else. Oh no, homework. Read Hebrews. Go read Hebrews now while you're in Leviticus so some of these things will tie together. And I'm just going to read you briefly and I'm going to close there with some of the things that Hebrews says so that you can see some of this tied together. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18. This is from the NLT. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope. 
through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus, for God said to him, The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees the better covenant with God. There are many priests under the old system, for death prevented them for, from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, His priesthood lasts forever. Therefore He is able once and forever to save those who come to God through Him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Next chapter, Hebrews 8, 1-6. through 6. Here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the, the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there, there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I've shown you. You've read that a bunch of times if you're where you're reading supposed to be. Here on the mountain. But now Jesus, our high priest, has, given, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a better, far better covenant with God based on better promises. Chapter 9, verse 1, the first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place for worship here on earth. Later in that chapter, this is an illustration, verse 9, pointing to the present time. Skipping down to verse 24, Kim. For Christ not, did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And He did not enter heaven to offer Himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now once for all time He has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by His own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes a judgment, so also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly await Him. Last week I read from chapter 10, and I'm going to close with this verse this time. Chapter 10, verse 19, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By His death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His command. Verse 24, verse 24, verse 24. Let that be a motto verse. Let us think of ways to motivate or spur one another to acts of love and good works. And verse 25 too, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but instead encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Twelve days if you want to catch up. I'm spurring all I can. Next week I might wear real, real, real spurs and kick you with a steel-toed boot. I don't know. It's your choice. Are you going to watch an hour's worth of television? Are you going to read an hour's worth of another book? An hour and 15 minutes is not that much to give God. Not much at all considering how much He gave to save you. Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You. We lift up Your name and we lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. We thank You for what You've shown us through Leviticus. 
and what you have brought us, the freedom that we have in Christ. Freedom to live a life of worth for you. Lord, I just pray an outpouring of your Spirit on this flock today that we do spur one another, that we do meet together, that we do do acts of good deeds and love for one another out of a pure heart and that we will be found righteous in the name of Jesus Christ when He returns for us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Amen.